Don't panic, I'm not Jamie Bamberg. You're like, he's really let himself go. <laughs> My goodness. How's everybody Span Expo Day 2 going? <laughs> Having a good time? Yeah, some cool stuff. Uh, it's about to get a lot more awesome, and dare I say, a little bit more sexy as well. Really, really, really honored to bring out our next guest. We know and love his roles, of course. Uh, you know, a Law & Order UK, Hornblower. Uh, he's been in a ton of amazing roles, but he also, of course, played a very pivotal part in a little show you may have heard of called Battlestar Galactica. Please welcome Leonardo himself, Jamie Bamber. Welcome back to Canada. Ah, thanks. It's lovely to be back. It feels like I never went away. Although, uh, this is a corner of Canada I've not visited yet, so... Uh, thanks to you. For those of you who have already been by the, uh, the, the, this booth, whatever it's called over there, um, you're a lovely bunch, and uh, I can see a few of you out there. It's lovely to be here. Um, I know I was meant to be here a couple of years back, and uh, I had a French movie that came up, which was... A great experience, but and then I couldn't be with you guys, so I appreciate your patience for those of you who've been sat in this room for two years. Um, <laughs> looks like most of you. Uh, <laughs> no kidding. Um, yeah, I'm very excited to be here, and uh, I know we don't have a ton of time, so should we? Yeah, well, we've, we've got a mic down here, so if, if you have any questions for Jamie, please don't be shy at all. Just uh, line up at the microphone. <laughs> Love it. No shyness at all. I, I want to ask you first, so you, you studied French and Italian. I did. Growing up, correct? Did, yeah. So have you retained your French? Oui, je peux parler français. C'est uh, une langue que j'adore, une, uh, une culture que j'adore. Et uh, je ne connais pas tellement um, le Québec, mais uh, j'aimerais bien vous visiter un jour à Montréal. Yeah. L'occasion n'est pas venue jusqu'à ce moment. I grew up in Ottawa, your French is a hundred times better than mine. So. Uh, did you retain any Italian at all? Un po', si sono capabile di parlare italiano, però ho, ho dimenticato troppo. Uh, ho, abit, uh, ho vissuto un anno a Pavia, in, uh, in Italia, però mi mancano le parole in questi giorni. You heard that sound, it was ovaries exploding. <laughs> <laughs> out there. Um, we're going to open it up in a sec. I want to <laughs> I want to ask you though, what, what about auditioning for the role, getting the role? What was your f first exposure to Lee Adama and what did you think of the character when you first read him? Because I I'm going to argue later on that more so than most of the characters in BSG, he, I think, had probably the biggest arc. But what did you think of him when you first encountered him on the page? Um... Well, I was looking for this character called Apollo when I first opened the script, yeah. and, and Ron doesn't call them that. And it was a very clever sleight of hand to have that call sign thing be, you know, take over the, the name from the original series. So uh, I couldn't find the character, first of all, and this Lee guy I started reading, going, is this the guy I meant to be for? I'm not, I don't know. But, you know, when I read it, what did I think? Um, uh, I, I just love the idea of a guy who's a fish out of water, who's coming back to the place he least wants to be, that sort of sense of just needing to get out of this space that's so controlled by his dad. And it was that father-son relationship that was really the be-all and end-all for the miniseries, which is all we were presented with originally. And it was something that I, you know, th those kinds of relationships are elemental, and I loved, I loved everything about it. And then when I heard Eddie was cast, uh, a, I thought I was going to be Farhead because the family resemblance is not really <laughs> all that. And uh, I thought he might have been a more important cog in this particular wheel, which indeed he would have been. But, um, you know, it was one of those things that just morphed every single day. The relationship with Eddie changed to the, you know, now he's one of my closest friends. And, you know, I see a different side of him. But originally he was very foreboding and, and real, you know, he really took this whole... Uh, Sort of, uh, he was, he was like the, the austere, stern, implacable dad, stroke teacher who you wanted to win over but couldn't, uh, you know, for the whole first season. So it was really all about that relationship. It was about me and Eddie, and um, uh, yeah, and uh, the, the script spoke for itself. Ron, Ron's mission statement, which was a two-page manifesto before the script even started, was so like balls out and and crazy that I thought this project isn't, you know, 
as goofy as maybe it could be. So it it, it, it kept me kept me in there, and uh, luckily six auditions later, I was lucky enough to get the job. Six. I think it was six. I don't know. Uh, first question of the mic. Hello. Hi. Hey, how you doing? Good. How are you? It would be Starbucks asking the first question. <laughs> Impetuous, much. I was just wondering, uh, from when you decided to go into acting to now, what was the biggest challenge you faced? Wow. Um, well, pr pr probably the biggest. Uh, was um, playing Henry the Fourth, uh, no, playing Prince Hal, even in Henry the Fourth, uh, one and two um, on the stage, just because you do get a real feeling that you are being uh, measured against other performances and other actors that have tackled that particular role and you know found wanting in so many areas, and and and, and the, that's the beauty of of Shakespeare and and the classics is that you're reinterpreting someone that everything, uh, everybody else has had a go at, and that's kind of intimidating. Um, so th I would say that was definitely the one where I was most terrified, for sure. And I was pretty scared doing Apollo as well, because at that stage I'd never worked in North America, and uh, you know, I was over for two weeks in LA and I got given this script, and uh, I managed to get this gig, and then, um, you know, the accent coming over, sort of feeling like you're stealing work from other paid up American SAG members. Um, I was convinced I was going to get fired every day. So uh, that, was, that was intimidating and Eddie was really intimidating. He just, yeah, he, just he, he never smiled at me once during the miniseries. He was just this fearsome man who told me that he was watching every single daily, every single scene and uh, how my accent, I should be in the character all the time, and you know, he was just terrifying. So uh, that didn't help, but um, I guess it helped the performance slightly because I was, felt like I was fighting for my corner the whole time. But uh, as I say, it completely changed in season one. And I, I, we were house hunting in Vancouver, and I remember walking into this house, and he walked out the same house, and I thought, oh shit, now we're competing for, the, for a rental. Um, but he had this, big ass grin on and just gave me this all you know awesome hug and um, relationship just switched overnight and he became the goofy Eddie that I know today so uh, you know he's, he, he, he created the tone on that show in so many ways and uh, not by accident he knew what he was doing he was creating a family but he also had to scare the living hell out of all of us first <laughs> well we know that you colored your hair darker to more closely reveal Edward's hair but is it true that he also wore um, blue contact lenses to match your perfect, perfect blue eyes? <laughs> Man. Sorry. You laid it on thick already. Um, yeah, he sort of said, hey, come here. And he got me in the makeup trailer. Stand there. Look in the mirror. And he looked in the mirror. And he looked at himself. And I looked at myself and I thought, oh, Fuck, how are we going to do this? And he said, you ever wore lenses? And I said, no. I'll wear the lenses. <laughs> you dye your hair. <laughs> and that's what happened. I said, yes, boss. Whatever you say, boss. You know, Michael Ryman, the director, who's like this Australian guy, who's like so nice, was not saying anything much. And so Eddie just made all the decisions. I mean, Michael knew what he was doing, because he was, you know, he, but Eddie likes to, you know, be the alpha, and um, we let him. <laughs> the mic. Hi, um, uh, Lee Adam. I've always identified with that character. I think he's great uh, as the offspring of a legendary father, and you're trying to go follow in his footsteps and trying to carve out your own path. So I really identified with that. So I, I thought maybe, um, you know, in honor of that, if uh, I could have a high five. Have you, have you, is your father legendary? My dad is a legend. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, you can have a high five. <laughs> so say we all. Awesome. Is your question a high five? <laughs> Whoa. Hi, my name's Caitlin. Um, I'm wondering if you have any advice for aspiring actors. Oh, man. Uh, are you an aspiring actor? Yes, I am. Good for you. Um, 
Yeah, I do. Uh, it's. I think the the problem with a lot of young actors is they 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 look too far ahead, you know, to to the big screen or the small screen. The important thing about acting is it's a craft that you learn each and every day, and it's one of those things you just got to get stuck in and do as much as you can. And in this day and age, um, actually, it should be, uh, you know, you're you're very lucky in the sense that. It, it, you, you can make a movie, uh, your friends can make a movie, you don't have to wait uh, for the audition process to sort of anoint you and say that it's time for you now. Um, you know, you could be working every single day and the, the thing is, is, is if you love it and if you um, are passionate about it, is to, to do as much as you can and uh, to take control. I, I, you know, it's the one thing I wish I'd embraced uh, younger because I guess I, I sort of feel like I grew up in the last generation that was pre-digital where, you know, um, there was still a mystique about film and TV and um, nobody knew which film was number one on a, on, on a Monday morning of the weekend, nobody cared. It, it, we didn't look behind the curtain so much. Um, but now it's just everywhere. It's Everyone is a filmmaker and everyone is an actor and everyone is a a writer and the, the, the thing is is just do it as much as you can and um, you know it, 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 it's that whole the more the more you practice the better you get and the more comfortable you get doing it so just stay in love with it and and keep keep doing thank you you're welcome good luck hello hi um I'm just wondering, because they're obviously very different settings, but still very similar stories in a way, if you noticed any big differences or similarities between being in Admiral Pelley's fleet when you did the Hornblower movies compared to being in Adama's fleet. <laughs> Everybody see Jamie in Hornblower? Yes. Yeah, um, the main difference was uh, Ed and Pelley would shout a lot, and uh, the other fella, everything was like this. <laughs> Um, so you had to listen, um, but I, I suppose uh, um, Robert, uh, oh God, I blanked his name. Uh, Robert Lindsay. Robert Lindsay, how could I do that? He's a legend. Um, uh, Ro Robert had to contend with the elements. We were out at sea and he was, you know, having to make himself heard over waves and wind and uh, Eddie was in the CIC with us all huddled neatly around and all very quiet. Um, but both fantastic actors and great captains in their own way. One just a bit more bombastic than the other. That would say that's the difference. Sort of the difference between acting in England and acting in America, where everyone in America is very contained and serious. And in England, projecting to the back, <laughs> to the cheap seats the whole time. Thank you. You're welcome. Hello there. Hey, how you doing? I'm fine, thank you. You can still do a little Adama voice just fine, right? I, I can still do the voice. Good. Uh, <laughs> I think so. I'd like you to say, uh, like you to say something that I was uh, aching to hear on the show but, uh, but never heard. Which is what? Well, for one thing, if you notice, I'm sure you've noticed all the references to Blade Runner during the show. Eddie's casting, this reference to skin jobs, uh, all right. parts, uh, Yeah, a couple of them, yeah. That sort of thing. I'm surprised. I'd like you to say in, uh, in, the, in the Adama's voice, thinking, thinking you're on the hill where... Uh, where what, Ed landed his raptor as grieving over, uh, over Rosalind's death, you put a hand on his shoulder and you said, it's too bad she didn't live, but in the end, who does? <laughs> um, I've seen Blade Runner, but not for years, so I won't imitate the delivery of the line in Blade Runner, if that's all right. Um, it's too bad she didn't live, but in the end, who does? You're welcome. Uh, well, just given the reference to Blade Runner, I want to ask you what your view of, of sci-fi was uh, going into PSG, and did your view of science fiction as a storytelling medium change at all while you were involved with the series? Uh, yes, it did. I mean, my, my view of sci-fi was, I suppose, locked in the 70s, because that's when I really followed sci-fi. I, you know, I, I, I was a I was the generation that fell in love with Star Wars as a, as a kid. Um, and, um, and I loved uh, like Flash Gordon, and I loved, uh, you know, I'd watch Blake Seven and uh, Doctor Who on TV. So that, that was very much, you know, my, my childhood. But I, 
And I even remember when I was in primary school getting together with a couple of friends and we had some magazine we'd make and we'd design spaceships every week. So I guess I was a proper sci-fi kid. I really, you know, really, really dug it. But I kind of left it alone in my teenage years. I didn't really follow it through. So I'd sort of lost touch with uh, what sci-fi was. I, you know, I didn't really watch any sci-fi on TV. Um, and I guess if I had a preconceived idea, it was kind of lots of prosthetics and pretty goofy. So, um, yeah, you know, Battlestar. I kind of, with this manifesto that I, I, I just mentioned, you know, when I first got the script, it did have a two and a half page of we are reinventing sci-fi on TV. We are not going to make space operas. It's going to be sort of documentary, realistic. Everything's going to be gritty and dark and plausible. And we're not going to have any far-fetched aliens and all the rest of it. Um, so I unwittingly was, was part of that resetting the sort of tone on, on sci-fi, but I hadn't, I hadn't really watched Stargate, which was, I guess, the biggest thing on, on TV at, at the time, and Farscape, and all those other things that I sort of became familiar with because I was attached to the sci-fi genre. But I was very proud to be involved with, with what Galactica was doing, even though I didn't understand fully, you know, quite how revolutionary it was. I, I just, uh, I, I sort of viewed it in the same mode as I did doing Band of Brothers, and we started with a boot camp like Band of Brothers did, and, you know, it, to me it was all about holding a mirror up to today's society in the starkest possible way. And the more Ron delved into the story, the more that became apparent with the Iraq war parallels and the, you know, the terrorism and uh, political uh, animosity and electoral, electoral fraud and, you know, all the stuff that was going on in the show it was seen to be very much societal more than sort of um, scientific fiction. It was more about social uh, fiction um, and, uh, you know, that, that sort of fitted me perfectly. But as a result, I've sort of fallen back in love with sci-fi. You know, I really enjoy what it can do. And great sci-fi is the best. Um, you know, uh, satire, the best uh, political observation, because it's pretty mundane just to sort of talk about our exact context today. And, and you sort of can say much more powerful, haunting things by taking them to their logical conclusions. Um, so, yeah, I'm very, very excited to be sort of back in the fold, as it were. Hey there. I'm wondering if on Battlestar there was another character that you wish Lee had interacted with more, developed his relationship with. Yeah. <laughs> well, six, well of course. <laughs> <laughs> she, seemed a, she seemed to have a lot going on. No. <laughs> no um, uh, yeah, yeah, no, there were loads. There were loads of characters that I didn't really get to come across. Uh, I, I'm, I'm only half joking when I say six, you know, but we, we didn't really have much. I didn't have much to do with any Cylons. I had no time for them. They, they, I think Lee was very much an old-fashioned, you know, these, these things of uh, toasters or whatever. Um, so I, I loved Grace and I always have a thing. Whenever I see Grace, I just go... I'm going to squish you. Because that's how I viewed Cylons. They were all talking about their humanity and all the rest of it, and Lee never really bought into any of that. Um, but I would love to have, um, you know, more to do with um, uh, with uh, Baltar. Um, I mean, I had a bit to do with him, but you know, it would have been more good fun to do a bit more of that. Um, but yeah, no, Trisha's character. I thought Trisha was brilliant in the show and um, in every way, um, <laughs> and that would have been fun. Did you eagerly read the scripts waiting for Oh, yeah. Page? Well, I mean, look, I mean, we eagerly read the scripts because there was no telling what would happen week to week. It was, it, you know, if I tried to summarize my character, it was like, he was, I don't know. It, it, we used to have a show in England called Busman's Holiday, where you go on holiday and do a job. And it was kind of like the, his holiday camp was to try and reinvent himself in a different <laughs> career every week. And it was great, because there was no boredom, you know, you didn't know what was going to happen. And also, you could have been killed every, every, each and every week, or turned into a robot, or, you know, that doesn't happen on television very often. Normally you're stuck in the same three sets, doing the same things. And we had the same three sets, but hell, we did different things in them, that's for sure. Um, that, that was the joy of the show, was, was really turning Ron's pages over and finding out what happens next. Uh, it's the saga thing, which is you know, uh, such a joy to work on when you can get the opportunity, even though TV um, executives and advertisers, you know, are, are a bit averse to it because it's hard to uh, have viewers, you know, popping in week in, week out to watch when they haven't seen necessarily every preceding show. But, you know, it was a gift. 
you touched on this, the different Lees, and I think he had a huge, huge arc within the series. You know, there was Galactica Cag Lee, you had Pegasus Lee, let himself go a little bit. You had, uh, <laughs> you had, you had Lawyer Lee. Hey, there's just more of him to love. <laughs> Why is that letting yourself go? That's, a, that's applying yourself in a different direction. <laughs> there was Political Lee, did you have a favorite Lee? Uh, I, I actually really did love Slightly Porky Lee. I, I, yeah, I really did. I thought um, it was just such fun to sort of... A, a, I'd never done that prosthetic makeup thing, and you know, it's, it's just crazy what they can do. And you're sitting three feet from the mirror looking at it, gradually getting applied and your face changing, and then, of course, walking around after it's finished and nobody else realizes what you've been doing, because it was really just an experiment the first time we did it to see if we could make it work. And walking over to the lunch queue and just seeing the double takes from the, from the sound guys. Jimmy, have you put on some weight? Yeah. And, and it fooled them. Like, and I felt really guilty when I was eating. I was like, suddenly I sort of felt that, I sh you know, it's, it's, it's makeup. Um, I, I, I'm okay, I can eat. Um, I, haven't, I haven't screwed the, screwed the production here. But um, yeah, it was, a, it was a, 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 such a bold thing to do. And that year jump that, that Ron did within a scene, which uh, I think was a sort of first, in a, in a TV show to do it within a scene, within a show, not sort of, you know, at the end of a show or the beginning of a new season. Um, you, everyone was trying to work out what to do with each character. And initially, the only thing that had happened to me is I got married and I had some glasses. So I was looking a bit more like the old man. Um, and it was Rhymer's idea. It was like, oh, you know, well, what if we made him fat? <laughs> He's like, he gets married. And what happens to married guys? They, they sort of let it let it all hang out. They just they don't need to impress anyone anymore. And it's been a year. How much weight could he feasibly have put on? <laughs> and he hasn't been fighting anyone because there's no war to fight. And uh, I was like, I love the idea. And I think it's, you know, rare in TV where, um, just on marketing terms, people tend to, TV shows are cast very much by type. They need type A, B, C, D, race, A, B, A, J, V, all the rest of it. And when you've got your types and they're successful and the fans like them. It's incredibly daring to change that. Um, they didn't really let me change it because if I'd had six months to go away and stuff my face with uh, fat burgers, I would have gladly done it and, and come back properly fat and very happy. Um, would have taken that hit? Oh, sh not a hit. I would have celebrated every second of it. It would have been great. I hate the gym. I hate all that. It would have been lovely. but. Um, you know, they, they were bold enough to do that for six or seven episodes. But by the end of it, I was very bored and tired of the four or five hours of applying all this stuff. And, and also the constraints with the lights and the sweat. And certain takes weren't usable because I tilted my head and I could fraction too much and you could see the, the join. And it was very technical. But what I loved about it is changing, you know, changing a character that you think you know. And, and uh, there's this one shot I always talk about where Eddie and I are in profile. And we'd never look more like father and son. Not that Eddie's you know, tubby, he's not, but you know, he's a 60 year old man now and uh, we just had that same sort of silhouette and it was, it was I, I, really satisfying for me. Hi there, um, I feel like if I was cast in something where I get to wear a spacesuit, I'd be wearing it all the time, so where's your spacesuit? <laughs> I can assure you, you wouldn't. Um, just because I, I always talk about it as like a mozzarella cheese bag. Um, it doesn't breathe, and by the end of it, you're swimming in your own juices in there. So, it's, especially when they lock you in a Viper for six hours, shine the lights on you, there's no air, you're drinking or you're breathing your air through a straw in the back and fogging up when you get excited, and by the end of it, you feel like I... Well, actually, they, they, they made us a short, short version, shorty version, so they cut the legs off so that when we're in the Viper, we can at least get air to nether regions. <laughs> and then there's the whole if you have to break wind thing. <laughs> and you do when you're in a quiet moment. And then 15 minutes later, you're in a scene with Oscar nominee Mary McDonnell and you sit down and gradually <sighs> <laughs> That's embarrassing. <laughs> that all sounds lovely. <laughs> well, how are you gonna stick with it? Well. Okay, next time I'll bring my flight suit and we can put you in it. <laughs> Let's see how that goes. Looks like it would fit. Hello, Mr. Bammer. Uh, hey, how you doing? My question relates to the production of BSG. Um, 
I've heard that many of the moments that we love as fans were actually improvised or added to on the spot. So my question to you is, were there any moments in the script that you felt could be embellished or added upon? And that is it's hard to do it. Um, there was a tone set quite early because M Michael Reimer is an independent filmmaker, really. He's, he, he'd never done it. He'd never sort of uh, been the sort of front director on a, on a long-running series before. And one of his films was actually entirely improvised, so he was very comfortable with that whole process. And whilst we had a script and a very strong one, what he would do is kind of encourage us to explore the bits between the dialogue. And, and, and it, it, most scenes in television, if you, if you notice, um, don't start at the beginning and don't end at the end. Like, people don't introduce themselves and they don't leave. They tend, they tend to cut into the argument and cut out once, once the big information has been imparted or the flip or the discovery or whatever it is. And what, what Michael would do is explore the beginnings and the ends of the scenes a lot, so in, which isn't in the script. So we would just inhabit the moment and, and see where it took us a lot of the times. And if some of the dialogue was feeling a bit sort of on the nose and a bit, and a bit uh, obvious, um, we would have all this other footage where a lot of it would get used. And the other thing about the way we shot is we had three or four cameras shooting in all sorts of directions any one time. So anything that happened in a scene would probably be on camera somewhere, whereas most television is it's all you or it's all me. So if I come up with an idea on my side when we've already shot the other side, there's never the reaction. You don't have it. Whereas we always pretty well always had the reaction as well. So there was a real sense in which it was embraced that if an accident happened or someone came up with something or something strange happened, it was part of the part of the scene and usable. Um, and and then there were moments where we went too far, and um, moments where writers in LA got very, very angry, and there were moments when all that kicked off, but we was all so close, it was, it was, there was no, no, no noses out of joint, it was just part of the process, and, and Ron, you know, very talented, very talented writer, is, is talented enough to realize that uh, accidents can be your best friend, and discoveries from, from different corners can be your best friend, and he embraced that to his credit. All right, thank you very much. Pleasure. But Breaking Wind, I noticed, was never integrated. <laughs> we, we never really put that in. Uh, we felt the show had a lot of, uh, a lot of sort of raw body stuff going on. Uh, it didn't need chuffing as well. <laughs> so speaking of raw bodies, um, <laughs> there's a lot of uh, visuals from your show that I'm sure stuck with fans, but once in particular stuck for me all this time, and I was hoping you could impart some more insight into filming that scene, being the towel scene from season two. I can't remember the scene you're talking about. Somebody have a video? Uh, yeah, no, it was, um, I don't know, it was one of those weird scenes where it had to, the whole point of the scene is, 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 um, you know, Lucy Lawless, Xena the Warrior Princess. <laughs> That's not intimidating, by the way. <laughs> uh, walking into a locker room situation, and um, it was an odd one because our locker rooms are co-ed anyway, so there's, there isn't that sense in which, um, you know, the, the male form or whatever is somehow shocking or it's... Uh, there's a thing, I don't know, with sports journalism, I've hear, heard it a lot, that apparently male athletes try and intimidate women, basically, by just being naked and just, you know, intimidating them, really, by you know, the awkwardness of their, their being fully clothed and female and they're naked in a sort of, you know, very male environment. Well, that's different on, on Galactica. So I was sort of conscious not to try and make it too much of an issue because it's not too confrontational. But also, I was extremely self-conscious because, you know, it's Zena the warrior princess. She's standing right in front of you, like, you got nothing on. Um, and, uh... Yeah, I was sort of nervous, but excited at the same time. <laughs> it's not every day you get to flash the the warrior princess. But not too excited. <laughs> no, I was nervous too. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it'll never, I, I'll never be able to lose that one. It's still to this day, if I ever um, sometimes Google myself, it's the first thing you see, wham, right there. So, <laughs> hell. <laughs> so, 
with the tendency on Battlestar Galactica to have these emotionally devastating things occur, did Ron Moore ever indulge in fits of maniacal laughter when these things were going down? <laughs> well, I never saw him writing at his desk, and that's when it would have happened, I'm sure, as he cackled. Uh, no, Ron is a lovely, lovely man, and, um, but no doubt, somewhere deep down, he, he likes torturing his characters. Um, so, uh, yeah, maybe on the inside, but he seemed very nice to me. Uh, he still attends my calls and stuff, so I don't think he took too much glee in it. But now he, you know, he, he, he just loved it. And um, his, his enthusiasm was so tangible. He was so emotionally caught up in the show. I remember before the writer's strike, he had to fly up um, to talk to us all, which, you know, Ron is a, you know, he's a real writer. He, he doesn't um, throw himself in, into the spotlight. He's not a sort of, uh, a natural um, rabble rouser and sort of quarterback like that, but he he came up and I remember this uh, speech that he gave about his union and standing by his union and, and how desperately sorry he was he had to shut down the production and how he uh, you know and he was uh, he, you know he was tear in his eye and he, he'd flown up just to tell us all this and, and left and uh, it, he was so deeply invested uh, in in the story that I'm sure it wasn't too maniacal. I think he felt. Uh, everything that he was writing. I think he was all the characters, and uh, that's why it's good writing. Oh, bless. And I think I even, even remember the questions, maybe. Yeah, just two quick ones. I was just curious, because I read in your bio that your mom was from Northern Ireland and your dad was from America, and I just wondered how they met, and if you could also talk about what your current TV series is. Well done, you. See, that wasn't so bad. <laughs> well done. Um, yeah, absolutely. My, uh, my, my dad's from Detroit, Michigan, not too far away. Um, uh, go Tigers, sorry. Um, and um, and mum's from Northern Ireland, from a place called Ballymena in County Antrim. And they actually met. My dad uh, was a lawyer by trade, although he never really practiced. Um, but he was working for CBS, I believe, in New York, or he had been. And he was like... He was like John Hamm's character in Mad Men without the advertising industry, sort of pin sharp little ties and martinis all day long and smoking cigarettes and having pictures of himself behind big desks. So he, he was that guy that came to Europe and Europe didn't know what to do. Um, and meanwhile, my mom was 18 years younger. She was 18 years old and she was uh, flying from very, very uh, provincial Northern Ireland to London uh, to start another term at drama school she was training to be an actress and uh, they sat down next to each other on this plane actually from Dublin and uh, I think dad gave her the whole crap about him being a, a producer for CBS or something and she immediately thought that was uh, a good avenue to explore and he cheesed it enough to uh, to get a date out of it and uh, and that's that, as it say. I mean, Dad had, had been married and uh, had four sons, which, who Mum then brought up as her own. I think she got married at 22 to, to Dad, so she took on an awful lot, um, and, and then had three of her own, so I'm one of seven, and uh, they're no longer together, unfortunately, but um, yeah, they were an amazing uh, couple. Mum certainly introduced me to, to, to acting at the age four or five. She cast me in The Wizard of Oz, as the Wicked Witch of the West. <laughs> I'll get you, my pretty. And your little dog, too. Um, I think was the line. Um, and uh, so she, she, yeah, she definitely encouraged me, and Dad was desperately trying to keep me on the rugby field and away from anything to do with acting. Um, which, 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 actually, he had some success, but it panned out this way. But, uh, yeah, they were great, great parents, but they did, did meet in the most, uh, I don't know, I think, what was Dad thinking? She was 18 years old, he was my age, just about. Bad boy. <laughs> but I'm very grateful. And then the next question, yes. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 I have, I shot a pilot earlier on this year for David E. Kelly, uh, uh, it was called Chelsea General, it's now called Monday Mornings, and it's a um, whip-smart uh, sort of drama set in a teaching hospital about a bunch of surgeons. Uh, I play a neurosurgeon, 
and it's based on Sanjay Gupta, who's the CNN medical correspondent's book called Monday Mornings of the same title, and it's fantastic. I've just seen the pilot, and it's so exciting. Great cast, um, Alfred Molina, and Ving Rhames, and Bill Irwin, and uh, Jennifer Finnegan, good uh, Quebecois girl. Um, and uh, yeah, we start shooting in a couple of weeks, and we'll, we'll be airing in January on TNT. So please, yeah, if you uh, can bear watching medical dramas, I know it's not necessarily your wheelhouse, but uh, I've met a few Law & Order fans this morning, so it gives me hope. Um, and Monday mornings, right? Monday mornings, yeah. Hi there. Hey. You were mentioning earlier how uh, sort of all over the map these character was in Battlestar, so very volatile and uh, morally conflicted character at times. I'm just wondering if there were any decisions that the writers made that uh, you as an actor didn't necessarily agree with, based on your interpretation of the character. Yeah, there were lots. Um, I'm trying to... There were lots. There were lots of moments where I didn't agree with, with the direction they were going. Um, but I... The, my, my battle with Lee was um, very much not to make him the goody two-shoes, um, not to make him too priggish, you know, not to make him too predictably principled. Um, because very early on, uh, I had a conversation with David Icke, uh, the executive producer, who said to me that basically Lee was kind of the moral conscience of, of the show. And he, um, you know, in these difficult decisions, he, he would always follow his conscience. Um, but I wanted that conscience to take him in surprising directions as much as possible. And I think we, by the end of it, we were in, all in tune, like entirely in tune. But the, the core of it to me was that sort of representing Baltar thing where um, there was a principle involved, but it was the surprising manifestation of that he, he, he ended up defending the, the, the person he least liked, least respected. He had no, he had no time for Baltar at all, but he could equally see that victimizing one man who was nothing short of uh, weak and not, not necessarily evil. Um, was just a way of galvanizing some, some sort of opinion amongst the others in this fleet, because Roslyn and Adama have made crazy decisions in, a, in, in similar situations, and Baltar maybe made the wrong one, but it, it wasn't malicious. Um, and uh, it was, that moment was when we were most in sync, I think. Um, I, I, forgive me, I, I can't think of, a, of an individual, individual moment where we, because uh, uh, things change too. We had this open dialogue, you know, we'd speak on the phone and uh, we would thrash it out and argue. And um, yeah, there, there, there were quite a few, but by the end of it, the debate brought us together rather than separated us. Thank you. Thanks. Um, did you, after Balsar Black was over, did you end up following the spin-off series Caprica? And, and was there anything in that series you thought was missing or should have been changed that led it to be far less successful than BSG? Um, I, I, forgive me, I only actually watched the pilot and um, I actually really enjoyed it. But I, what I felt was that it was a different show and didn't really benefit from being a spin-off to Battlestar, it was about its own thing. It was a different take on, you know, it was much more about, uh, you know, alternative reality than about Cylons, and I didn't really watch anything else. So, uh, I enjoyed it, I thought it was interesting, the sort of teen bedroom clubbing kind of virtual reality thing, and I, uh, if it had been me, I, I think I would have enjoyed to put that in its own context and not have it linked at all to Battlestar but I didn't then pursue it as a series, um, so I can't really say uh, any, any more than that. Then I enjoyed it, but I couldn't really see the connection between the two shows. I thought it was slightly tenuous, and maybe that's why it didn't quite absorb all of the fan base. And maybe it scared off those that you know might have watched it anyway, had it been called something different. And, uh, one more question. Would you um, ever be reluctant to take on other sci-fi roles for any fear of being typecast into a certain genre? Uh, it, it all depends on the role. Um, it all depends on the project. You know, uh, I think some of the genre material is so mainstream now that I don't think that really applies. I think it applies somewhat in television. Uh, I think a lot of sci-fi actors tend to get churned up in the same sort of things because the way casting works nowadays, it's all about 
Twitter followings and fan bases and stuff like that. So I think there is a slight trap for actors that if you've got a fan base that's very loyal because they've watched you in this, producers sort of go, well, that would be handy. We could use them and put them in this. And I, and I think that is a danger uh, for actors if you're, if you're serious about um, variety in your, in your career. And so it's something that I do think about. Um, but uh, in the movie world, I think you know, sci-fi is very, very mainstream. Um, and I, I would have no hesitation doing a sci-fi movie. Um, the, the material to do a sci-fi TV show would have to be, you know, interesting enough for me to, and that's the first and foremost thing anyway. I, I, I would have no hesitation if it was as good as Battle Star. Thanks. You, you. So we got a few more questions. Okay, I'll, I'll try and mop these up and be brief, which is not my forte. <laughs> um, I, I just two sort of little questions. Wondering if, um, I've heard that both Katie and Eddie knew that they were, from the beginning, not going to be Cylons. Um, whether or not you were kind of maybe terrified of being named as a Cylon, or did you even know that you weren't going to be a Cylon? And secondly, um, I wanted to know what it was like working with your wife. Uh, um, yeah. <laughs> uh, it never really crossed my mind that I might be a Cylon. I think the, the core of the show is to have this nuclear family, and the family really is uh, Eddie and I, and Katie is a surrogate sister, and to some extent, Mary is the surrogate mother. And I pretty well knew that wasn't gonna get messed with, because once you start doing that, then, you know, you, you, the emotional core of the piece is in danger. Um, and it was, it was amazing to have my wife on the set. I mean, you know, we, we got married during the production, we had three children during the production, Kerry put her own career on hold to be there, and it was Eddie, really, that, um, just told her that she would be in the show, and it was about making Carrie believe that she should be. And then she auditioned, and um, which was weird for her, because she obviously knows everybody backwards. We were around our house at the weekends, and she, and she got the role, and it was lovely. And she had episodes that basically I wasn't in, that she was, and she would fly up from LA to shoot them. And you know, it was very special for her to you know have a part of it. And um, and that's all really thanks to Eddie, cool. Thank you. and Ron, and Ron Moore. Thank you. Very welcome. Um, I'm quite nervous to ask a question, but it's my first con, and I live on the other side of the world, so it doesn't really matter. Um, <laughs> I'm from New Zealand. I can um, tell. <laughs> you may be the first I've got lots of cousins from New Zealand. You may be the first in this country. Uh, my question was, I was wanting to ask a sci-fi guest what it's like to be the focus of the huge amount of fan media that's around, so fan fiction, fan vids, all that sort of stuff. You know, it's it, it's really humbling and exciting because like we're in this industry that's there to entertain and there to reach people, and it, it, it's it, it, you know prior to this I had never actually met the people that watch the show, so it's an extreme privilege to be able to do so and to look at you all in the eye and and to talk to you about it. It's something that's very passionate to us. The, the flip side of that is um, I'm I'm very aware that this is not reality. It's not my reality. I, I don't walk around every day. Uh, with the idea that people are looking at me or people know who I am, I don't. And um, I'm very conscious to sort of register that this is not real. This is a sort of, this is not my reality. But it's very nice for the weekend to feel like uh, Johnny Depp. <laughs> <laughs> but it's just for the weekend. I then go home and the wife tells me to take the washing out. So, <laughs> back to reality. Depp's got nothing on you. Nah, he's got nothing on you. I'm a big fan of his. Hi, I was just wondering what the chemistry between working with Richard Hatch and you were on or off screen because you sort of played the new Apollo. Uh, well, I was terrified because everything that he'd said about the show was pretty uh, dismissive, it felt like. Um, so I was very apprehensive when he'd been cast. I thought it was a bit of a stunt and I was, uh, yeah. But then I, I walked into the read-through, I knew he was going to be sitting there, I was kind of nervous. And, you know, he couldn't have been more gracious and kind and excited, and he has uh, continued uh, to be just the nicest nicest guy. And he's got some amazing stories about the original and that amazing uh, time where he basically didn't leave a lot at Universal. He was there the whole time, living in his in his, uh, in his his trailer. And, you know, he's he's been through a lot, Richard, and it was very gratifying that we were able to um, find each other in, in that whole process. I was very privileged to have him there. And it was, uh, yeah, it added a bit of meta television to the whole thing, which never is a bad thing, especially with the press, uh, which helped as well. But he's a lovely, lovely man, and it's been a pleasure getting to know him. Thank you. 
And I am sorry, but we do have to make this next one the last audience question. Sorry, guys. Uh, sorry about that. I do want to ask you quickly, though, you touched on the heavy themes of the show. Was it a fun set to be on, and do you have a favorite uh, a memory in that regard? Oh, it, yeah, it's an incredibly fun set to be on. Um, you know, there were so many of us. It was such a big cast by the end of it. Um, and we really were a family away from home, socializing together. Um, you didn't work with the same people week in, week out, because some people would just not be in the story for a while, and then you'd have things to catch up about. And, you know, the crew grew to love the show. They were very proud of the show, so we had the local crew really behind us. Um, individual moments, oh gosh, you know, it's so many. Are getting wasted at one of the rap parties and dancing with Mary all night long and not letting her leave. <laughs> that was a good one. Uh, she's awesome. And uh, yeah, it was, you know, we, we're all still very close and very much in touch. And Mary organizes a get together every year, for example. And, you know, it, 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 it was fun because, yeah, the subject matter was dark, but Gallo's humor always prevails and you've got to have something to laugh about. Although the work was taken really seriously, we didn't muck around at all. what your most prized possession is as a remembrance of Battlestar. You know, that's you such a good question, because I've just been cleaning out my garage. <laughs> garage, as I would say, um, as I should say. So the uh, question is really, what did you steal from the set? <laughs> well, what did I steal? Not very much. Um, I, I think the flight suit, obviously, was the one piece of wardrobe that I was allowed to take away, and it's, it's the thing I suffered in the most. And it's still hanging in the garage. I don't, no, I don't think I'll ever put it on again, but... Yeah, that's, that, that is probably the most precious in the sense that I know there's also a massive price tag on it if I ever did have to get rid of it, right? <laughs> Can I start the bidding? <laughs> uh, the other thing I love, all the dog tags. I've got every season's dog tags and some commemorative ones. Those are very, very important to me too. And um, uh, there are notes and scripts and signed books and compilations of photos and all those things. But the one thing in particular is uh, in, in the very finale in Daybreak, you get into my apartment as a flashback with the birds in there and I'm with a broom. Ask Ron what that's about. Um, and there was a, a model of a viper on the table, which is that diamond cast model, which I know some of you've got uh, with, you know, uh, Apollo. Uh, Leodama on the side of it, but it's just a little model of a viper, but it's, it's beautiful and um, it was in the show, it was featured in the show and it's a limited edition and uh, that, that's very special too. And those didn't get thrown out, but some of the